All right. Good evening, everybody. I appreciate everybody coming in on this evening. Um, Dr. Kevin Jefferson, podiatrist here in Washington, D.C. I have the pleasure and the honor of serving as the chair of the Podiatric Medicine and Surgery Section of the National Medical Association. We have family, friends, board members, and, you know, very auspicious guests here uh, with us tonight. Again, as I mentioned before we started recording, is that this is very, uh, we're going to be very loose, you know, very informal. We're talking about residency. We have some residents here. We have Dr. Huma Hawk, who is a rising third year uh, resident, and she's also the first resident member of the board of the podiatry section of the NMA. She's going to talk about her experiences and what she's looking forward to in, in her final year. Uh, we have myself. I'm going to be talking about uh, what it's like to be an attending physician in a teaching program. And then, of course, we have the D Dean of American Podiatry, Dr. Lawrence Harkless, who's going to be talking about his uh, view as being a residency director, what he expects of residents, what he expects of all of us as uh, we move forward together in this field of uh, podiatric medicine. And once again, you're sideways, Doc. Sorry about that, bro. I'm still sideways. I'm sorry. You're still sideways, man. <laughs> really? Uh, no, I yes, think it switched back and forth. There you go. Yo, there can you, you see go. me now? Now we see you. I mean, we used to see you before, but you were sideways. All right. So I'm going to, uh, I see uh, a couple of board board members here from the podiatry section. I'm going to have uh, them introduce them, themselves. Uh, Dr. Adrian Atkinson Sneed, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Unmute and introduce yourself. Okay, sorry about that. I'm driving. Um, I'm Adrian Atkinson Sneed. I am in Atlanta, Georgia. I finished Temple in 2000. Um, I'm currently on this board and then also serve on my local board uh, for Atlanta Medical Association and also for the Georgia State Medical Association. Um, I'm glad you guys are all here. I think this is a wonderful program and I'm here to answer anything you like. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ha? Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Dr. Harkless. Um, should I just introduce myself? Is that what we're doing? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Huma Hawk. I'm a PGY2 um, here in New York, and I graduated from Barry in 2021. So I see some Barry alum uh, in the Zoom meeting as well. So that, that makes me happy. So welcome. Uh, Debbie? Good evening. My name is Debbie Burton. I am the section administrator for the National Medical Association, and I know Dr. Harkins very well. He's one of the old timers when we were the NPMA. I work in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm not a physician, but I help you guys get stuff done. Glad to see you trying to get through school. Well, for those who, who are unaware, Debbie is our eyes and ears and heart and soul. She keeps she's the glue. She keeps the section rocking and rolling and keeping us all together. We love Debbie. She is like, if, if you ever in Scout, she's the den mother. For those of you who know what that means. Dr. Harkins, you introduce yourself a little bit. Unmute yourself, Chief, unmute, unmute. No, I said I was a residency program director at UT San Antonio at the Health Science Center for 30 years. And I was the founding dean at Western uh, University College of Podiatry Medicine in 2007, 2009 when we um, admitted the inaugural class. And I was there for 10 years. And then I uh, retired and moved back to Texas, which I'm from originally. And I was the uh, interim dean to found the uh, new school of podiatric medicine at the University of Texas, a Rio Grande Valley. So uh, I look at education as a continuum. Uh, UME is undergraduate medical education students, GME residents and fellows and CME, private practitioners, uh, faculty members, as well as retirees. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So as, as we get going, you know, if you have a question, you know, the, again, this is a small, small group right now. It's just family. 
Uh, it's informal, so you don't have to do the hand raising and anything else like that. Just unmute and chime in. We, you know, we can all learn from each other. Again, the point of tonight's gathering is to give people who have that have just graduated. And first of all, I forgot to open the meeting the same congratulations to the class of 2023. Uh, we're very proud of all of you guys. We know it's a difficult road. You know, you're getting ready to start uh, a new path. And we're here to let you know that the podiatry section of the National Medical Association and the National Medical Association as a whole, we're here for you. We're here to support you in whatever you need, whether it be education, just emotional support, spiritual support, you know, just to find out what makes us tick in this crazy profession of podiatry and medicine and healthcare delivery. So reach out to us. And uh, we're here for you. We're glad to call you colleagues now. You're not students. You're, you're colleagues. And we're still here, we're still, still here to help you uh, move along. Again, my name is Kevin Jefferson. I've been practicing uh, in private practice here in Washington, D.C. now for 24 years. And I've been uh, in a, in a attending uh, podiatrist and foot surgeon at Howard University Hospital here in D.C., so, uh, you know, I've been a resident, I've been a fellow, I've been an attending, I've been on all three levels. I, I, I haven't been up to the level of Dr. Harkless, but I'm trying to get there. So we're going to go ahead and get, get started real quick. First um, panelist we'll have uh, get going is uh, Dr. Hawker. And then we'll have her reintroduce herself briefly and then talk about what life has been as a resident for her. And again, for all of our attendees, if you have a question, you don't have to wait to the end. Just chime on in. Go ahead, Dr. Hawk. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name's Huma Hawk again. Um, I'm a second year podiatry resident. Um, I also want to echo what Dr. Jefferson was saying congratulations to everyone. I don't think we have too many students here, or incoming interns here, but whoever is here, congratulations. Huge feat. Um, so you should give yourselves a pat on the back. Um, so that's first things first. I made a list just to kind of structure myself um, so I don't go on it. So, um, you know, I know it can be intimidating. Um, I, I would that sense of like, but, oh my! I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, Dr. Hawk. I, we can't hear you. I think Dr. Oh. Hawk, maybe your yeah. phone is is okay. Oh, is it better now? Can, can you hear me? Oh, okay. What What did you hear, or what was the last thing you heard? I'm so sorry. You're talking about your list. Yes. Okay. So just to structure myself and make sure I don't go on a rant, I made a list. Um, so what I was saying was, it's okay to be intimidated about starting. See, I think you're human, and if you weren't intimidated. I think you, that would be very concerning because, you know, you want to do a good job at your job. Um, so embrace the kind of uncomfortable kind of feelings that you're getting um, at the thought of starting. Um, I think it's important to go into it with humility, um, which I'm sure every one of you has because you wouldn't have gotten this far. Um, but I say that because going into your intern year, you have like a very unique role. Um you're going to pretty much know your patients arguably better than anybody on your team because you're primarily the person doing floor work, depending on how your program is structured. Um, so, you know, really embrace that, you know, have the tenacity to learn, have that sense of humility and, you know, really embrace the fact that like you are going to learn your patients better than probably anybody on your team, sometimes better than the attendings even. Um, and so, so really embrace that. Um, I would say even though podiatry is such a niche profession, it is very like interdisciplinary. And I think you're entering your especially, you see that quite a bit because you go on off service rotations. Um, again, you're the one primarily like contacting consults, contacting other specialties. Um, so even though it can be kind of like physically or, you know, like kind of like laborious or taxing, it's a really good learning opportunity because you do get to learn, you know, how to, um, function in like that interdisciplinary sort of way. So really embrace that. Um, and then, you know, in terms of organization, um, I still do this, but I learned to do it my intern year. I have like a little tiny notebook, like a, like a memo book. It's like this big. 
Um, but I write down everything. And I know that sounds silly. And you, you might feel silly when you whip it out and write like the tiniest thing on it. Um, but it's really saved me because um, I would say one of the most annoying things, just this is all like anecdotal that attendings um, get upset about is if you, you know, don't do something that they said or didn't order something that they wanted or didn't um, like do some kind of task that they really um, like emphasize that you do. Right. So just to avoid all those things, I would have like a little notebook or maybe mm -hmm. even a phone, I would just jot down throughout the day, like things you have to do tasks you have to do. Um, especially your intern year, you're going to primarily be running the floor, you're going to be running um, the, the list of patients because your seniors will likely be in surgery. Um, so it's very important to do that. Okay. So um, the other thing is make sure you feel supported in your residency program. Um, I mentioned being, you know, having a sense of humility, that's super important, but I think you also have to be objective and look at whether or not you feel supported in your program. Um, if you feel like you're not being supported, you're not getting the support from your seniors or from your director. Um, you know, I think it's, it's valuable to voice your concerns if you can. Um, you know, you're there to learn, you're there to learn surgery, you're there to learn how to be um, a good practitioner. So if you feel like you're, you know, being discriminated against or anything like that, um, I would urge you to speak up and say something. Um, if you feel uncomfortable doing that, because I know that's like a daunting, I've been guilty of it as well. Um, you know, when I, I feel like I need to say something, but then I get intimidated. Um, I would urge you to just write it down, maybe even um, write down whatever happened, write down the date, just to keep kind of a log of it. Um, and then maybe at a later date, you can, if you feel comfortable, you can discuss that. Um, but definitely feel you have to kind of gauge the level of support that you're getting at, at your program. Um, if you don't feel like you're getting support at your particular program, there's several ways you can get it outside of your program. Um, the, the, the NMA is a great resource. Um, I'll volunteer myself as, you know, you can get my contact information. You can contact me if you need support, um, if you need advice. Um, but I think that's very important as well. In terms of cases, um, something that I started doing a little later that I wish that I started earlier is going over cases with my seniors. Um, you know, sometimes it's not enough just reading McGlamoury's or reading a textbook before like a big case. Um, it really, really, really helps to go over it with somebody that's been in that case um, that can kind of go through the steps with you sequentially and ask you things and make sure that, you know, you really understand um, what you're doing. I think it's very helpful. It's very interactive. So definitely utilize the people around you um, to do that. And then lastly, sorry, I know it's kind of long, but definitely have fun. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a very taxing and kind of physically and mentally challenging time in your life, but it's a really great learning opportunity. You're going to learn so much. Um, and even though you're going to spend pretty much like the like majority of your time in residency, definitely have some hobbies. Um, definitely have some outlets that you can utilize to kind of decompress and separate yourself. Um, Cause especially my intern year, I remember I'm, I'm very much an empath. So I remember, um, you know, like coming home and still thinking about patients that had lost their limbs or conversations I had with family members or things that I did wrong orders. I didn't do correctly, stuff like that. You know um, you definitely, it's, it's good that you are passionate about your job and you want to do a good job. But it's very, very important to have an outlet and to kind of separate yourself uh, from that as well. So I know that was a lot, but I hope it helps. So. Does anybody have any questions of Dr. Hawk before I ask her to extrapolate a little bit more? Any, okay. other, any, other, any other new graduates or anybody's rising up have any questions of Dr. Hawk? Okay. So I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit, Huma, on, yeah. on I mean, there's, there's, there's so many things that we can talk about. We're not going to try to get it all in tonight, of course. But yeah. what did you find was the, the, the hardest transition to make from student to resident when you, when you became an, uh, an intern? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I think for me specifically, um, I struggled with imposter syndrome quite a bit, and I still sometimes do. 
I think getting out of that mentality of I'm a student, um, you know, I, I don't have the autonomy. I don't have the say so and getting into more of like a, I mean, e even as a resident, you do lack a little bit of, of autonomy, but getting into that mindset of, okay, now I am a practitioner. Like I am a provider. Um, and really kind of embracing that I think was difficult for me. I think I, in the beginning, I lacked a lot of confidence, um, especially because, you know, I was, I was surrounded by people that, you know, all these really smart attendings and my seniors and stuff like that. It's, it was easy for me to become intimidated. And mm -hmm. I think, and that's why I encourage everybody to just go in with a sense of humility, but you know, have that kind of fundamental belief that you belong here, because I think a lot of us, you know, struggle with that. Um, so for me personally, that was my biggest challenge and just constantly reminding myself like, okay, like it's okay if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You're not a bad provider. You're not a bad resident. Um, you know, things happen. And then just learning from that. I think that was the biggest thing is just dealing with the imposter syndrome and not being hard on myself when I made kind of the initial intern kind of mistakes. So. So you went to Barry. Yeah. Now you're in New York. Do you, yeah. did, you have, did you have any connections in the city prior to, to getting up there? Or were you kind of, or did you feel like you're on an island? Figuratively, figuratively and literally, since you're in New York City. Um, I, did, I didn't have any professional connections. Um, I had some personal connections. I have some really good friends here. Mm -hmm. um, but I did feel kind of like I was on an island. And that's also, I'm glad you brought that up because that's also something I struggled with. I didn't feel like that sense of community initially because I didn't know anybody. Um, so I think that's also very important um, to kind of have that community wherever you're at. And it's easier said than done, you know, like I, even though I had my friends in Brooklyn when I was there, like it's, it's hard to see them because they're also residents and it's hard to kind of, you know, like see, like do things that you would normally do and establish that sense of community. But even if you find yourself struggling with, you know, finding your tribe or finding friends or anything like that. That's why I said it's important to do things that, you know, bring you peace and things that can help you decompress because um, sometimes you're not lucky and you don't, and you do feel isolated and you do feel like you're alone and you're in a new city and you don't, you know, you're kind of on your own. So. Talk, talk to the uh, up and comers about the, the rotation experience going through the different, uh, medical uh specialties with you sure yeah so um this this kind of varies based on your individual program but for the most part your intern year you'll do the bulk of your off service rotation so for me that was um what did i do I, that was in, internal medicine radiology um vascular surgery which was the toughest for me i think it's probably one of the tougher ones for everyone um what else? Um, endocrinology, infectious disease, pathology, um, and then emergency medicine. And then there's a few more that I think we have to do, I think my third year this coming year, but um, that's, that's all I can remember. But you're, you, you do the bulk of your off service rotations, um, your intern year. And it's really great because, you know, so much of podiatry is, you know, communicating with different specialties, especially like vascular infectious disease, um, so when you go to these off service rotations, you kind of get an inside look as to like how they go about, um, you know, seeing our patients and how they kind of think through their own diagnosis about this patient, how they make their recommendations. Um, so I think it's very important and it's very insightful. Um, and you know, it's, it's very easy to go on some of these rotations and say like, Oh, this is, it's not important. It's not podiatry, but it's very important. Um, and I think especially with my vascular rotation, you know, we have such a tight um, relationship with vascular, no matter where you are, you're always consulting vascular. Um, so I think, you know, that, that rotation in particular, it's very important to kind of, you know, establish who you are and, you know, build relationships. And, you know, again, it's, it's a really unique learning opportunity as well. So um, definitely don't, don't sleep on your, on your off service rotations because you can learn a lot. So is anyone else, especially those who have good, just graduated or may not yet graduate have graduated or are still in residency, have any questions of Dr. Hawk before we move on? Now's the time, fam. 
You don't want to. Hi, Dr. Hawk. I have a question. Hey. Hi, my name is Sandra Smith. I am not uh, in residency just yet. I'm actually going to be the first incoming class um, of LECOM, Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. So I am just now getting my feet wet. I start in July as a first year. But I did want to ask you a question regarding um, before residency. Like, So during those rotations, could you speak to your process of choosing the rotations that you wanted to go on your fourth year so that you could prepare yourself for where you want to apply during, for residency? What, when you say rotations, you mean like like your externships, like where you go and travel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, really quick, I see my little in this. Uh, her name's Shama. She's fantastic. I don't know if she has any insight as well, but she's great. Um, but no, to answer your question, um, you know, I think it, that's a good question because I think there's so much like arbitrary kind of information out there as to how you should pick your, um, your programs for your externship. And you have to figure out what you want in a residency. I think that's the most important thing. And I'm so glad you asked because when I was a fourth year or third year student and I was picking residents or picking externships for residency, I, I didn't really have a rhyme or reason as to like how I was picking them. I was kind of picking them in terms of like, um, you know, like, like region, like what's close to DC, which is where my family is, or like, or like, oh, like I know somebody here. So maybe I'll go there. Or like, I heard this is a really like cutthroat program. Like maybe I'll learn a lot. So like to, to your point, it, there was no rhyme or reason. And I wish I kind of made a list of what my priorities were in res or what I was looking for in a residency. And I think that would have helped me figure out where I wanted to go for an externship. So I think you have to figure out, you know, location wise, are you open to one particular location or are you, I'm sorry, are you confined to one particular location or are you open to, you know, any, any location? I think that's a huge part of it. And then you have to kind of think about like your lifestyle. Like, are you a city person? Are you okay with a more suburban kind of lifestyle? Um, are you okay with, you know, being in like a more like rural isolated kind of area? Um, and then I think you have to look and, you have to look at the program specifically and maybe that at that point you can talk to the residents at that program, maybe talk to other students that have been there um, and kind of see what you want. Me personally, if I could do it all over again, um, I would look for a, in, in a program, I would look at a program that, um, you know, is very, um, it, it's like a very teaching friendly program, number one, because we're all there to learn um, a program that, um, kind of does maybe like 60% emphasis on surgery and maybe like a 40% emphasis on clinic. Um, because I think if you get, if you get a little bit, if, if you have more clinic than surgery, I think that, I think that's very valuable, but you might not be getting the surgical training that, um, you need. So I think, I think that's very important. And again, this is just, this is just me. Um, and then I think it's important to look at how the residents are treated. Um, I think if you're going to programs where, you know, the attendings are just like lashing out at the residents and, you know, um, screaming profanities and whatnot, maybe don't go there. Um, or if you've heard that a particular program, um, discriminates a little bit or is, you know, which I know sounds silly to say, but trust me, it happens. <laughs> um, you know, that's something to, to be concerned with as well. Um, and look at kind of the relationship between attendings and residents. Um, is there like a really big kind of um, like power dynamic at play? Are they treated kind of like peers? Um, you know, and also I would look at um, when you're in the OR with them. Um, and, and this is more for like when you're at the externship, sorry. Um, when you're in the OR with them, like, are they explaining things? Are they letting the resident, you know, do some of the procedure, all of the procedure? I think those are things that you should look at as well. Um, and also something I didn't look at, which is, I also think is important is salary. Um, and that kind of goes back to region. Um, I think you need to kind of take that into account as well. Like if you need to make, like if you have a family or if you know that, you know, you need a certain amount to take care of yourself, your family, I would, kind of think about that as well, because depending on where you go, the salary can, can range from, it's, it's a very wide range. So I would kind of urge you to look at that as well. Um, 
and and yeah, I think I think overall, if if you go to a program and you feel comfortable and you feel like you're learning, you're being challenged, you're not being chastised, um, and that you feel like you can really grow there, I think those are the makings of a really really good program. Um, so yeah. Thank you for that. Closer to externships, I'm more than happy to like, you know, I I don't know where you want to end up for residency, but I'm more than happy to you know, give you my contact information and share any kind of information I have on the programs. Oh, okay. so. thank you. I'll send you a private message in here. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions for Dr. Hawk about her experience so far in her past two years as a resident? Okay, so I guess it's my turn. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have another question, Dr. Dr. Uh, soon to be Dr. Smith? So what I'm going what to I'm do going at the end, is it possible to ask some questions of, of her sure. when she was actually in medical school? I'm sorry, say again? Is it at the end, is it possible to ask her a few questions that pertain to when she was actually in medical oh, school sure, versus sure. We're, we're, prison? We're, yeah, everything's an open book tonight, my friend. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. So, uh, where am I now? All right, so again, I'm here on the panel representing attendings, but also as a former resident. Uh, I'm a graduate of New York College of Podiatric Medicine. I did my fellowship at Brooklyn Hospital Center in New York, in Brooklyn, New York. I did a fellowship thereafter in an advanced foot surgery in Brooklyn. And then I went out into the world to do my thing. I've been doing it now for uh, 24 years here in DC. What every one of you should understand uh, as, a, as a resident in, in a hospital, a teaching institution, that you have to first in your own self understand that you belong there as much as anyone else. You belong there as much as the CEO of the hospital. You belong there as much as the chief resident of your program. You belong there as much as ortho, OBGYN, internal medicine, family, whatever. All right. Don't ever feel less than because you are a podiatrist. When I came through and I see some others that are, uh, here this evening in this meeting. Dr. Williams joined us a little while ago. She's also uh, one of our board members, Dr. Everett Williams. Uh, we went through some rough times just being podiatrists, let alone being physicians of color, not being understood of what we do and how we do it, what our knowledge base is. You're as knowledgeable as everyone else in that place. So always realize what your worth is as, as a resident, be an open book. Realize that on mm -hmm. July 1st, it's a completely clean slate. It doesn't matter where you went to school, it doesn't matter what your GPA was, it doesn't matter where your, what your rank was when you came out of, out of your class. It doesn't matter if the program you're in is your first choice or your third choice. You are in the spot now, you are in the place and it's time to get to work, it's time to learn. It's time to share and it's time for you to suck up as much information as you can as a resident. Okay. Another thing that I, I want you guys to know is that the podiatry part of your program is great. The podiatry part, the skills you're going to learn and everything else will set you up for the rest of your career. But keep in mind that residency is to make you a well-rounded physician not just a, a podiatrist, but a well-rounded physician. So take every rotation you get, especially like Dr. Hawk said, uh, in the first year, you're gonna be in, inundated with a lot of stuff. But suck, suck, suck up as much as you can. Make friends and allies throughout the hospital, not just your podiatry uh, fellow resident. Make friends in the different uh, specialties. Learn from them, learn from their attendants. If there's time available and you're not going over your number of hours for the day or your number of hours for the week 
and you have, you know, an extra hour or two, ask the ortho residents if you can jump in on a case, whether you're just observing or if you even get the scrub in and see an ankle fracture, see a total knee replacement, go to general surgery and see some trauma, see some stuff you ordinarily wouldn't see uh, on your rotations and get to know the uh, attendings and the other rotations and the other specialties by name, make friends, make allies. You'll never know when you'll come across these folks again later on in your career. And they're going to be, oh, yeah, I remember Dr. Hawk when, when, when she was just a younger. And now we're in the same city, uh, working in the same community. Get to know as many people there as you can. Also keep in mind that in the hospital situation, the hospital, there really is no hierarchy. Yes, there are people in leadership positions, CEO, and other people on the admin side, and they have their duties. But again, you are just as important as anybody else in the building. But also understand that you're not any more important than anybody else in the building. From the CEO of the hospital down to the person who cleans the toilets in your patient's room, to the person who takes your parking ticket. Everybody there in that hospital, their first goal is for the care of your patient. Everybody has a role to play, bringing food, everything, transportation. Everybody is your coworker. I had an instance when uh, I was in the OR and one of the podiatry residents pulled the me doctor, you nurse card on one of the nurses just before the case started. And they got, they got into a back and forth. He told her, I'm the doctor, you're just a nurse. That's the quickest way to make an enemy throughout the entire building. So to cool that situation down, I had to dismiss this guy from the case and bring somebody else in to assist me because that nurse was going to ream him anew. Okay, this nurse was, you know, 20 years deep. And here's this kid, you know, right off the conveyor belt thinking, you know, he's the Surgeon General and, we, and nobody's going to have that. Right, so understand your role, learn from everybody. Trust me, on the floor, and Huma, you can attest to this, Dr. Harkness and everybody else has been through this. Those are the, your, the nurses know your patients better than you. They know what makes them tick. They know what pain medications work for them. They know what pain medications don't work for them. They know if they've been cheating on their diet. They know a whole lot of stuff. They know how many uh, visitors they get. They know if they've been doing their incentive spirometer. They know all of it. They know all the stuff that you don't know, all the stuff that does not go into the chart. So, yeah. yeah right? I just want to go, go ahead. Ahead. Like, um, it's obviously treat everybody like Dr. Jefferson was saying with um, a lot of respect because like he was saying, you're no better or worse than anybody. But nurses in particular, I mean, they know their patients so, so well. So it's in your best interest to kind of use them as a resource and not like Try, like don't be com combative with them. Um, I know sometimes it can be frustrating, but um, they're there to help you. So kind of don't, you know, try to establish that relationship with them. Yeah. So. yeah. Never pull the doctor card. Don't do never. that. Because no one. Do that. <laughs> we, they, they, they tell us that every year and every year somebody tries to do it and it never goes well. It never goes well. Your attending is going to take the nurse's side 100% of the time. That's just the way it is. All right, because the, the attendee's not trying to make enemies in that building. So make make friends. I mean, you know, I was friends with a, a lot of people in my hospital, not just house staff. I was the only doctor, not just resident. But I was the only doctor on the hospital software. Everybody else was uh, security, food service, you know, housekeeping, all that. And I got to hang with those cats as well as, you know, folks on the medical side. So as I would as I would go through the building, you know, hey, Dr. J, what's up? And it'd be one of the security guards who was my third baseman or whatever. You know, you're going to have some times where the schedule gets hectic and you're rushing to get to, to the cafeteria before, before it shuts down. And you're hungry. You're a broke resident. You don't have money to go out Cross the street and try to grab something to eat because you're on call. You want to get something that you've already been paid for to, to, to get some dinner before you start your call. 
And I've had plenty of times where that happens. Clinic runs over or a case runs over. And I come in there looking like a starving waif. And the cafeteria, cafeteria staff will say, hey, Dr. J, let me fix this plate for you real quick. I know we're closed, but I got you. Okay, you need to make those type of allies. These are the type of folks that will uh, look out for you and, and, and keep you lifted up because that's what you're going to need. Dr. Hawk also talked about keeping up your, your emotional side, your spiritual side. Whatever activities you have going into the residency, keep that up. I'm a musician. I'm a jazz trumpeter. I kept it up. I'm still playing to this day. All right? All those, all those stuff, whatever you have, don't put them aside just because you're a resident. All right? but, but before I move on to Dr. Harpus, one more thing I want to talk about is, and I know we have another resident or two in, on the here, and I want them to say, say their piece as well, is that some of you are coming into the program with families, your own families, spouse, a child or two, or what have you, that happens. One of the things that you have to make your family understand, whether you, you have a spouse or, or, or children or your family that may be in town, your parents or what have you, they're very close to you or they're within the same household. They're residents too now. When you're on call, they're on call, right? You know, whom you got uh, co-residents co that have families? Um, yes, I do actually. Um, you know, girlfriends, spouses, children. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even someone like me who, you know, I, I don't have a family, but even my own, you know, immediate family that's in DC, mm -hmm. you know, like when I'm on call, my, my whole family knows that they know not to call me, but it's taken time for them to understand. And, you know, you, you do like Dr. Jefferson said, you do have to kind of make them understand, um, what they're going into. Cause it's, it's not an easy feat. Um, so I, I definitely echo what Dr. Jefferson's saying. Everyone's a resident now. So mm -hmm. everybody, everybody you're close to. And one thing uh uh Huma also, almost also talked about was dealing with the adversity piece. Right? And this is serious business. And the reason why I bring it up this evening, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but there was a, a, a sister in New York, an orthopedic resident, who took her own life last week. Right? Some of you may have heard that story, especially those in New, in New York and the East. In, in that region, all right? And she was a 30-year orthopedic resident. You know how difficult it is for a Black woman to become an orthopedic surgeon in this country? But the stresses were so great for her that she took her own. And we all know, we've all been in difficult spaces. You know, we don't always have it together 100% of the time. And residency life can be difficult, can be challenging. And it's extremely different from what you're used to. All right. It is a job. We Some of us have had jobs before, whether it be flipping burgers or what have you. It's completely different because you're given a whole lot of responsibility from day one. Nobody's going to care where you came from. You're here now. You're in our building. This is what we need you to. And you need to accept that and learn how to deal with the different uh, difficulties that are going to come along whether it be interpersonal, whether you're being treated unfairly uh, by co-residents, by leadership in the hospital, by your residency director, we've had issues, all right? Whether it be treated unfairly and getting cases, whether it be racial, whether it be uh, sexual harassment, whatever it is, you have to let somebody know what's going on. You have to take issues up the chain of command and deal with it and let them know that you're there to learn, you're there to participate. You're, you're there to help the patients in the hospital and the community, and that you will not be subject to abuse. And then you have your your, your crew here in the uh, NMA National Medical Association to bounce off uh, and to advocate for you if there's an issue. We've had to do that in the NMA. Had to go to bat for residents around the country who have been being dogged by their program. No, we can't have people feeling like they're on an island and then they have, they, they feel no other recourse. Okay, so we're here. For, as a resident, you have free membership in the National Medical Association. Okay, I, I put the uh, website in the chat, uh, nmanet.org. 
go there, fill out the uh, application, fill out the part about the residency, then you're going to join the uh, podiatry section and get in and get involved with it. We're here for you. We're cool, right, Debbie? Let me tell you, we're cool, Pete. Um, right, so, you guys, ahead. I just touch on the, that point you just made, Dr. Jefferson. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if we have circle back at the end if you want. Okay. It's up to you. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to allow, just kind of echo what Dr. Jefferson was saying about advocacy, um, particularly self-advocacy. Um, I kind of touched on it when I was speaking, but I didn't want to elaborate too much because I didn't want to be a Debbie Downer. But the mm -hmm. um, reality is that you should be an advocate for yourself in residency. Um, there, You're going to deal with all kinds of stuff, microaggressions, um, you know, racism, sexism, all kinds of stuff. Um, I've dealt with it and, you know, the, there's a large part of, of medicine that looks like me, right? So I can only imagine what others have to deal with. Um, so I think it's important, like Dr. Jefferson was saying to, um, don't gaslight yourself if something happens and you know that it's a microaggression or it's something that's inappropriate or something that doesn't sit well with you. Again, I would urge you to either write it down to maybe revisit in the future when you feel more comfortable. Um, or if you feel comfortable, I would address it head on with your director or whoever you see fit, um, because these things happen all the time and it just perpetuates this environment that's uncomfortable for people um, and leads to situations like Dr. Jefferson was talking about where this you know young lady took her life, which is horrible. Um, but I definitely urge you to please don't gaslight yourself. Um, it happens all the time. It can happen in small ways, like I said, microaggressions, um, or it can happen in more kind of um, obvious ways. Um, so please, please, please advocate for yourself um, in that way. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Of, of, of I have you? one. Go ahead, Adrian. Yes. So, um, um, hey, hey, Adrian, go, ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself again. Before. Yes, this is Adrian Atkinson Sneed. I'm the scientific chair and vice chair for national and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, um, practicing what 23 years. So um, I, to piggyback on what she just said, um, definitely I want to maybe put all of our numbers. I want you to save all of our numbers in your phone. I mean, it's okay if you save my number in the phone. Um, if something ever comes up, you're welcome to chat. You can text me. I'm old school. So text me. I won't see email all the time, but text me. I don't care day or night. And when I do see it, I'll address it. If there's a situation that happened at the hospital that day, if you feel some feel, uh, if you feel down for some reason, this is your forum. And then we will, if I can't fix it, then I'm going to send it to the board. Like, Hey, have you guys experienced this? What can this person do? Do you know that director? Do you know this hospital setting? Do you know the city? something to address it but this is the this is your chat line um this is this we are the people so to talk to and you don't have to wait from nine to five or be formal or anything like that to say i'm having a hard time or i think i lost a patient or i think that i missed something it's okay i mean it's at the end of the day you're there to learn so you know, don't try and push. And when, one other thing, don't try and push anything under the rug. Don't try and um, pretend like it didn't happen. That's the worst thing you can do. You're there to learn. Um, but don't let it get to you personally. And um, and just make sure that we are a resource. And again, you are part of the NMA. So I would like for everybody on this call to register. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. All you do is as a member, then you have access to a lot of other um, uh, pluses. You're, you're part of over 50,000 doctors that experience the same thing in residency. And so you there's a wealth of knowledge there. Or you're part of a bigger group. And the earlier you join, the more you're vetted. So please, while it doesn't cost you anything, it doesn't, it, it only makes sense to just join, to fill out the application and be a member. And um, I know that you're in residency, you can't attend a scientific conference, you may not be able to this fall, 
but you never know. Um, there might be a day or two. We'll be in New York next year, D.C. the following year. We might be in your city and you can contribute. And then, of course, always um, if you want to lecture, you don't have to be an experienced lecturer like Dr. Harkless. You know, you can there's everybody has their first time and you'll be just fine. And we'll tweak it to what you need to um, whatever you want to deliver. We'll be there. But I will. Um, I'll let the program move on. Thank you. Uh, anybody have any other questions or comments? Yes. Is this free for residents only? It's free. It's, it's free for residents only. And and st students, there's a student uh, National Medical Association. So they're 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 separate. But they're, they're, okay. under, but they're a separate, separate organization. But as soon as you graduate from medical school and podiatry school, you're instantly a member if you fill out the uh, application. That's all you have to do. Okay, right, thank you. Well, then hit the submit button. Boom, you're in the fan. Okay, so don't don't hesitate. And if you if you if what are you, are you class twenty four? No, no, no. I will be the first entering class. So when I graduate, it'll be twenty twenty seven. Okay. Well, you, you and it's okay to be involved ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not yeah. a member, you can still be involved and. In, come to events, be on calls, just like tonight, so. Okay, thank you. Dr. Everly Williams, just uh, an another board member. Could you introduce yourself to the group real quick, please? Okay, I'm Dr. Everly Williams. Um, I practice in um, the suburbs of Chicago. I've been practicing, ooh, I'm really going back now, almost 28 years. Um, but everything that you have said, I agree with. Um, I work with res residents all the time and um, I'm attending at one of the hospitals. Um, but I noticed that a lot of these residents at a particular hospital, um, a lot of them seem to be at this particular hospital I work, but they overworked, seem to be stressed out a lot because they're doing so much. And that's something that basically is going to go along with being um, a resident. But I will say, whenever you start choosing your residency, think of what you may want to do. You may want to do surgical. Um, you may want to do wound care. So look at the program and make sure you're getting a little bit of everything. Um, do a well-rounded program where you are getting vascular, you're getting dermatology, because all of these things are going to come up one way or the other in private practice. Um, I, you know, my residency, um, I came out of school a little later in life and certain presidents, I mean, residents um, programs, I avoided like Dr. Harkless. He didn't know this, but I did not want to be getting up five o'clock in the morning and all day. <laughs> so I looked at things <laughs> a little differently. I was like, I'm not going to do that program. But look at the programs <laughs> and, and, and see what you want to get out of it. Now, my programs were both. I love my programs. I did an orthopedic residency and um, a surgical residency. But I did look at the programs and decided what I wanted to apply to and which I didn't want to apply. Um, but everybody is different. And, and you may not even have that choice. You may just have to, you know look at where you want to live or where you want to start out at. But um, but look at everything. Don't just look like I did. At, I looked at programs that were going to be easier, I thought. But the more knowledge you get, the better trained you are when you come out. Um, but I'm in Chicago. If anybody ever comes to Chicago, you can look me up. And I can post my number as well. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So if there's... No more questions or comments on the, the section we just had. I'm going to turn it over now to well, one last me. thing, Kevin. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The, one last thing. So, um, what Dr. Everly just mentioned about where you want to be, um, you really need to research even the state law because I've had um, a couple colleagues that they went through a program, they learned everything, they went to another program, they thought they were getting. Well, they went to even a jump school where they were serving where jump schools. So they learned everything you could about ankles. And then they moved to Alabama where you can't do ankles. And so you have to understand where you're where you want to land. Mm -hmm. 
because now they went through all this training on ankles and in that state doesn't allow ankles. So uh, make sure you research, um, and this goes back to the, I think one of our first questions, know where you want to land first and work your way backwards um, so that you know that you are in compliance with the state and then you, and then you create the externships or you search the externships to support what you want to do. That's my last comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to turn it over to the Grand Dean of uh, Podiatry. Uh, I think everyone is well aware of Dr. Dr. Harkless and what he's meant to each of us personally, what he's meant to the profession of podiatry, what he's meant to medicine and healthcare delivery in this country and around the world. Uh, I want to let him uh, talk about the perspective of a residency director, what he's going, what what residency, residency directors are going to uh, expect from each of you. Dr. Harkless, you're up. I'm mute, Doc. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, got gotcha. you. Okay, good. Well, this has been a very, very interesting and a lot of great information by everybody. Uh, I guess I could probably talk all night, <laughs> but I won't do that. Um, first, um, it's all about one word learning. And so if you are starting school or if you're just graduating, starting a residency, uh, it all boils down to one, two words, uh, learning objectives. So if you are a student just starting in podiatric medical school, make sure you review your learning objectives and make sure that you know the learning objectives. Did you achieve what the objectives uh, ask you to achieve. And that's important because uh, as a first or second year student in school, uh, you may talk about an ingrown nail or a hammer toe. Well, the same learning objective that you had from day one is the same learning objective you had at year seven by the time you graduate from your residency seven years later. And so um, the uh, uh, Dr. Hawk, I think, had, uh, was very, very good about the uh, learning and the rotations. And several of the, of the uh, staff and uh, Dr. Jefferson and Sneed and Williams, et cetera, uh, talked about the rotation. So, so I would say this, that the, that the healthcare systems value us as podiatrists for our comprehensiveness. Historically, we put all our emphasis just on surgical and surgical numbers. And that's really, really important but you need a good comprehensive program. And I think several individuals mentioned that. And you'll get paid more to practice medicine than you do to do surgery where everything has changed over my almost 50 year career. If that makes sense in terms of where medicine is today and how much uh, uh, it's changed. So uh, there's a, someone mentioned less than, I call it the less than society. Uh, everybody probably feel, feel a touch of that from time to time. And then there's a thing called biases. We all have biases about lots of different things because we are all the products of our environment and, and opportunities to experience and grow to become. So I'm a 3B guy, be, behave, become. And so life is a process of, uh, of, uh, of becoming. And so, but it all goes back again to that learning objective and being sure that uh, you do, do you know that, and, and it's okay not to know. Nobody has a monopoly on knowledge, and the smartest people uh, in the world that wrote the textbook. If you ask them a question, they'll say, "Well, Harkless, I really don't know. I need to go read. Let's talk about that three days later, or whatever." And so, don't be scared to ask a question, and don't be scared to say, "I don't know." The challenge is is to go find out. And if you keep asking, the answer will come and you'll know how to go about achieving what you want to, uh, the objectives that you want to uh, become. And so the, to me, that's, uh, those are some of the major, uh, major points. So I always say learning how to learn is uh, better than knowing. And today you can look up things and you can learn in real time on the computer if you know how to do that and go look up any article you need to look up in real time. Uh, right there on the spot. You can, you can do that if you know what to do and how to do that. So your best friend is your librarian uh, at the hospital or if you're associated with the teaching medical school or whatever, 
Uh, the librarian is, is your friend and they can help you with a systematic review or Cochrane collaboration or whatever you need to know to know what the best three evidence-based articles are on any topic. And the key is uh, that you really need to, to know that, but that's a process of repetition. And it's the repetitions that make us excellent at what we do. Now, Dr. Hunk also talked about organization. So when the biggest thing I learned from training residents is on July 1, I would get nine new interns. The only thing they had in common was a doctorate degree. They're from different environments. They think different. They learn differently and all that. And as a teacher, I had to learn over time that I had to meet each residence where they were and, and give them time to grow. Now, everybody may not think about what education is and the teaching learning process because in, when I was going through, and I think, think still today, that a lot of the programs pick you based on academics. That ain't got nothing to do with your ability to learn and how good you will become over time because that's all in the heart. And they said, um, God knows the, um, the heart. But most people weren't looking at that. And so even when I came through in 1975, I was in the top 10% of my class. And I was the 31st alternate at the podiatry hospital in San Francisco. I thought if I didn't get any program, I'd get that program. And so, and, and they never really pretty much asked me anything I didn't know. So I said, well, what's going on here? But I had enough confidence in myself to know that I was as good as any student in America at that point. They just didn't give me the opportunity. But I ended up at UT San Antonio on a whim. But God has a plan for all of us. And so we have to understand that if uh, he's uh, blessed you to pick podiatry to go into it, he's going to bless you with all the things you need to do to grow and become. And so the most important thing that I've heard tonight is, uh, is ASK. And everybody that's been on here with any gray hair or getting to get gray hair said, you got my number, call me and, and let me know if you need anything. But what I would say is that the phone doesn't ring much. People want to bear their own burden. They don't want to tell anybody what's going on. They don't check in. So I'm admonishing all the residents and everybody to make sure you check in with Dr. Jefferson and Sneed and myself and whoever, uh, because whatever you're trying to do, we can help you and encourage you and, 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 and to become. And that's, that's basically uh, the most important point in the process. Uh, Jefferson, I could talk all night. I, I think I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll stop there. I've had all kinds of different uh, residents. Uh, people will blame, make excuses, don't want to own what they did or didn't, uh, didn't do. But the key is uh, the three, I call it TLC, teamwork, leadership, consistency. So you have to work on a team. Dr. Huck talked about that. And uh, the key is, um, is sharing with everybody. And let me say, one, uh, I had a resident once that uh, told me that um, I, had a, I met with the residents every Wednesday morning at 6 o'clock for 30 minutes. That was the gripe session. And it was um, highs and lows. What did, you, what did you have a high about last week? And what was your low? And then if they had an issue or concern, they had to have a solution, not just complaining and whining about um, about 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 whatever. Uh, so I needed to be motivated to continue to teach. But what was happening is on every week, a resident or two would tell me about something they did or something that they encountered and how they overcame it or whatever they needed. I mean, I was, I was learning as much from them as they, was as they were learning from me. And so it was a symbiotic uh, relationship, although I was the leader. And they thought I knew everything, but I didn't know everything. I, I'd admit what I didn't know if they asked me. But uh, I had to read as much as they read to be prepared to run conference every week. And so, uh, but, but setting a bar high for learning is, is so important. And I think that's the, the, the big key. And I'll close with this is that uh, you need an outline for learning clinically like you do for um, information gathering from the patient. I've said this before on, on, a, on a similar venue uh, that uh, Jefferson asked me to talk about. But it's about um, uh, etiology, epidemiology, natural history, risk factors, clinical presentation. Uh, differential diagnosis, what they have, why, and prognosis. So if you write anything in the differential and you don't know, just say, need to go read. Be honest. <laughs> it's okay. That's why you're there, to learn. And so don't let anybody intimidate you 
uh, because you didn't know anything. Uh, we had a professor named Sandy Pierce. He won the Presidential and Excellence Teaching Award twice. He was a pediatrician. But he had a famous quote that said, be right, be wrong, but be something. And so that's what you're there to do, uh, is to learn. And if you don't know it to, today, if you go read tonight, then you're going to know more tomorrow than you did the night before. And that's just the process. And the more you do that, the repetitions is how you become expert at, uh, at what you do. And that will happen if you continue to do that in a very good program. I do think that uh, several uh, of our um, attendees and staff mentioned tonight that uh, you need a well-rounded uh, program. But I will tell you is that if you're just in surgery all day, it'll probably take you three to five years to learn how to practice if you don't see patients in a clinic. And you're not going to know what the truth is if you don't have a clinic where you can test and prove the attending. And so if you don't have that, then you need to make sure you go to the attendant's office to see what happened to that patient so you know for yourself. Otherwise, you're not sure. It's like reading a book. But nothing is more important than that experience. And I'll stop there. Uh, Kevin, I'm honored to, um, to share. I have, a, I have a lot to share, and I'm open to being uh, called to ask at any time to, to share. And we're only as good as the as we connect with the individuals that can uh, help us grow and become. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments of uh, Dr. Harkins? Now's your opportunity to ask a question of one of the all-time greats. Right here I just want to say thank you, Dr. Harkless, and you guys that are all on this call don't understand just how how important this meeting is tonight to actually get to speak with him. So even, no matter what you have to ask, he can answer. Um, but um, the, the the great Dr. Harkless, thank you, Dr. Harkless. No, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be, be on. I, I actually have a question for if that's okay for Dr. Harkless. Yeah, yeah please, go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, that was very, very helpful. Um, and I really appreciate it for somebody like me that, um, is going to be looking for jobs like within a year or so, um, what advice would you have for me in terms of jobs to look for and kind of what to look for? Because it's kind of a taboo topic. Nobody really talks about it. Um, so if you could just speak on that, that would be great. Um, well, it depends on where you want to go and where you want to practice. Do you have an idea about where you want to end up now? Uh, where you yeah. like to? Um, my whole family's in the D.C. metro area. Okay. Um, so I'd like to go back there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, you need to look at the Maryland, Virginia, and the D.C. Podiatric Medical Associations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know in, I'm in Texas, so we have a state association and they have a a newsletter that goes out on a quarterly basis. I think we have some online as well where you can click in there. So I'm looking for a job, you know, put your CV there. I talk to the executive directors in those particular areas and tell them who you are and what you are, you are looking for. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's also important that you look, reach out to your attendants and all the people you know and the network of uh, the people on the phone tonight and then that network. It's all about the networks of the different people. Uh, mm -hmm. because um, you don't know who knows who and how they can help you. And it's interesting <laughs> that you said that. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I had two residents that came from the New York College back in probably about 2001, maybe 2002. Mm -hmm. And so at the uh, opening of the uh, residency, uh, uh, the um, beginning orientation, uh, I asked them, uh, how did you get to – San Antonio from New York. And they said, well, we drove. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, how did you know which way to go? And they said, well, we Google it. And I said, really? I said, why you didn't call me and ask me about which way you should go? And they kind of looked at me kind of like I was crazy. And I said, well, you could take a 95 to this and so-and-so to that. I gave them about two or three different routes to come out of New York. Mm -hmm. And I said, and, and more importantly, I know people all along the route. I could have told you probably 20 people to stop by and say hi and have some coffee or lunch or something along the way. And so, but that's what happens when you want to Google and not connect with people. And that's yeah. the most important thing that, uh, that, that we can do. 
in the, in the process. Nobody came into the world by themselves. Uh, we didn't pull ourselves up by a bootstrap. Some people say that, but a whole lot of people helped us along the way. And right. I think uh, Dr. Jefferson mentioned that uh, at the county hospital, which was uh, the Rob B. Green, Bear County in San Antonio, that's where my office was. I, and like Dr. Jefferson said, I knew everybody in the hospital. I knew people, anything I needed, I knew 10 people that could give it to me because they came in the hospital. I'm talking about from mopping your floor to sweeping your floor to mm-hmm. a pair of cowboy boots, whatever it was, there was somebody, three or four people that could do it. And all they had to do is talk to the people every day. But people get up here as a doctor and forget about that you have all these just basic people every day. And I'm an everyday guy. I grew up on a farm, so I know where everything comes from. Because I had to, we had to grow it to eat, <laughs> if that makes sense. So, so it's it's about those those connections uh, as it relate to your um, questions about getting the job. Now, let me say one other thing: people sweat the job, but you need to be looking for a job now. Don't wait three, four months from now. You need to start searching that from DC, etc. So, you send me a note. I know a whole lot of people in DC. And Dr. Dr. Uh, Jefferson is there. He's been there for 24 years. So, mm-hmm. right. so he, know, he knows more than I know. For example, uh, you went to Barry. Dr. Steinberg was a fellow with me, and he spent about five, six years on the faculty with me. He runs a program at the Washington Hospital Center. Yeah, I'm familiar with him, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, I mean, I mean, he, he knows tons of people. And my old roommate, who's a heart surgeon, he's uh, he's not practicing anymore. He has Parkinson's disease, but uh, he was there for umpteen years, and he trained at Kings County in Brooklyn. So, I mean, you know, I make a phone call, and it's just amazing and how God connects the things that need to be connected for you to, to reach your dream and to continue to grow and serve in the, in the society and the kingdom. And so, to me, that's what it is. So, the people that do ASK, ASK is Ask, Seek, Knock. Three different things. That's Matthew seven and seven in the Bible. So that's that, that's the key. Mm-hmm. And 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 if people, I've never asked someone to help that didn't. Um, if if I asked, if they didn't help me, they sent me where I could get some help through someone else. Usually, that's a general rule. Right. Somebody will know somebody uh, that can help you. You realize that, and that's why we sometimes think that I can't do this, I can't do that, because we don't do the ASK. Mm-hmm. And and the ASK is. Um, that, but it also get asking is getting insight, perspective, and approval. Those right. are, I have a seven things for success, and that's five, six, and seven. In, get insight, get perspective, get approval. So that you should be doing that on everything uh, that 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 you do in that regard. So I'm happy to, uh, you, as I said, you have Dr. Jefferson already there, and. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, Howard is there. You have the VA. There, are, Dr. Mm-hmm. Trump is over there. I mean, I, I know tons of people. I'm not in D.C. every day, but as Dr. Jefferson know, we all meet each other, know each other. You, you all don't know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it becomes pretty, pretty simple in in that regard. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, so just, it's just a matter of, of reaching out to those uh, societies. But let me just say this: uh, you have the VA. Let me say that there's um, right. academic medicine. You need to look at that. Uh, you have private practice where you can go in with a private guy or you can go in with a group. Seem like things now as for hospitals and more group practice and all of that. So you need to look at that. Who are the groups in the D.C. area that covers Northern Virginia, Maryland, all of that. And you have our, um, the uh, the MedStar. It's, 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 it's hospital systems. So you need to go Google that. Hospital systems, Maryland, hospital system, Virginia. See what they are. And then you come get a list of that. Once you create that, then you may want to contact me and say, hey, these are some systems I came up with. Do you know anybody in the system? And somebody would know the, C- the CEO. I know a lady named, um, let's see, her name is um, um, Corona Pierre. She does uh, like the Joint Commission of Hospitals. They do the, all of that, but she's a podiatrist. Now, most people ain't thought about doing nothing like that, but I met her and took her to dinner, and she just blew me away. She do all the um, fairly qualified health centers. That's another thing that, that hires a lot of podiatrists for comprehensiveness, and you and they pay you a good salary overall uh, in terms of uh, starting out. The system's going to pay you more than a private practice will. More, it's, more, it's more called than a black, sorry, the, the position she has? You said it was what? Uh, she does the um, accreditation for, uh, for the hospital. Okay. Surgery centers, as well as um, the uh, federal qualified health centers. 
Oh, I see. Okay. She, she's kind of on the surgery center for qualified health centers, but I know two or three podiatrists that also do, do joint commission stuff as well. Right. Okay. Got it. Right. Thank you. And what what residency program are you in in New York? I, I didn't I, I didn't hear that. My, my it wasn't clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I I was at uh, New York Presbyterian um, in Brooklyn, New York, um, and now I'm at St. Joe's. Who is the which, program director? James DeMeo. Yeah, I don't I don't know him. Okay, no problem. Well, we, we'll talk. We, we we can get on the phone and 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 be uh, be helpful in that in that regard. Thank you but, so much. But for everybody that's um. Uh, doing that, the key the key is 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 uh, paying attention, and um, and participating in the things within the school and the residency program where you would basically know what's going on. But that's uh, when you're in a residency, it's like you don't have time to go to the bathroom, so <laughs> it's hard for you to, to to think about doing something on the on the side. But but that's why it's important to be organized. And I mentioned that a little bit. Um, when, when residents struggle, they struggle in three areas. They're poorly organized, they don't set priorities well, and they can't summarize information. Those are the three things that I found uh, that that uh, residents will, will struggle, struggle in. And if they're not honest with themselves and have humility, they won't admit where they are. I always say growth doesn't start until you, until you admit where you are. And so, but I was down to earth with them. I call them in and I have a come to Jesus meeting with them and sit there and have that conversation. And if they humble, I meet them where they are and they'll grow. And I try to try to encourage them along the way. But that's a process. But a lot of programs are busy and they don't want to take the time. They want to teach to the smartest resident, not embrace everybody uh, for learning, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say that before, but those are the three things. And let me say this. Uh, I was in a program with uh, had a, every re a resident in every specialty in medicine, and we had residency quarterly evaluation. I mean, uh, residency directors meeting quarterly, and so and I was podiatrist. The rest of them were all MD. So, but but what I just told you was the same for every discipline. I don't care who they were, could have cardiothoracic surgery, the smartest guys in medicine, AOA in medical school. They all would struggle if they never had a job because they never had to do anything. They never had to make a list. Most people don't even know how to make a list in terms of to go. To, what did I forget? You mentioned that several times. The Chinese proverb says, no memory is as firm as faded ink. So if you're going to remember it, you better write it down. And you told me that, see? Yeah. And those are little things I would tell the residents. The only thing, uh, a mistake is not a mistake until you do it twice. Did you learn from it and grow? That's all I ask. Because I, I, I would tell them this, if uh, something happened bad, they ain't going to say you messed it up. They're going to say Dr. Harkless team messed it up. And I, I tell them, I said, I can take the heat. But if something happens, I said, ladies and gentlemen, let's don't ever, 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 ever let that happen again. And I'm through. I ain't going to say that no more. If you're paying attention, people going to, somebody going to catch it. The medical student, the first year resident, somebody's going to catch it and it's a team. And I ain't mad at nobody. All, all thing we learn together and taking care of patients at the highest level. That's it. I Thanks, got up on I got up on I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, 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 Audrey, I want I want you to uh, Audrey and Gallo, I want you to introduce, introduce yourself to everyone real quick. Yes. Hello. Good evening. I am, first of all, I am, all right, let me introduce myself first. I'm Audrey Ngalu. I am the meeting planner for NMA Podiatry. It is my pleasure uh, to have been, to be working with this incredible uh, group, as well as to, for the, this is now the second year, um, and to have been on this call from the, from the top of it. Dr. Hawkless, I just wrote a note to Adrian. I didn't want to interrupt your talk. I just said, Dr. Hawkless is awesome. So inspiring. Inspiring, sir. I feel like I've been to church. I'm from New Orleans. Guess where anime is this year, guys, in my beloved <laughs> Crescent City. Um, and again, I, I'm, my hat's off. Uh, I've been, again, working with uh, Miss Debbie. Uh, she, she helps keep us all in line and, uh, and, and has kept this boat afloat for I, I don't too long for her to want, to want me to say out loud, so I won't. Um, but to you, you, Dr. Hawk, you and all of the others who are uh, coming through uh, as uh, as rising, but as right. Thank you, Debbie. As uh, wait, Debbie, you're unmuted. Okay, I'm sorry, Debbie. That's okay, um, Dr. Hawk, and 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 all the others. Uh, uh, just 
how impressive it is uh, as a layman to have listened to you all. And uh, I, my prayers are with you all as you journey through. Um, and there are many patients waiting for you to show up. So uh, appreciate being a part of this group. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Purvez or Dr. Patton Williams or uh, Sonali's iPhone, did you have any questions or any statements you'd like to make at this time? Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Williams. I recently graduated from Temple University and I will be attending Jefferson Health Stratford, New Jersey for residency as a, a PGY-1. I do have a couple of questions. Um, my situation is kind of different in the sense that I'm in the Air Force and I was curious to know if anyone knows of any podiatrists that are in the Air Force because it's kind of few and far in terms of who you know in that type of uh, field. So I was trying to get connected with someone that is um, in the Air Force. And then my second question is, um, because I'm in the Air Force, after I complete my residency, I have to give three years to the, ser uh, to the service. And because of that, I cannot complete a fellowship. And I was wondering, how does that affect my ability to practice if I don't complete a fellowship? So I can, uh, so one part I can answer is that I met a young man. I'm, I will look for his name. Um, um, I can't remember it off the top of my head. But so he's a podiatrist and he was the head of military, of all of military, all services. Um, I think he started in the army, but he was head of all of military recruiting officers and so um he was um one of the things he addressed was he was he was focused on minorities and he was also focused on those kind of challenges um even like age and sex discrimination um but one of the things he said was there there definitely was a workaround so even if you didn't have like the fellowship you wanted um there was there was always an opportunity um there was a military type of opportunity or um what do you call it like um a not an excuse but um <clears throat> there was a workaround for that and so so no there were ways around it so he was um i will i will bring up his name i'm going to take i um, will note your name so i can send that to you okay uh, if you can put your information in the chat but yes, so he was in the military and he was actually recruiting me for the military. Um, and that was maybe like, maybe like 10 years ago, maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. So but I know he's still in it. So, um, but I will give you what I know, but there okay. we have a lot of members that go through it. And one of the things that the military does is that no matter what, you are what your specialty is is based on years and rank and so forth so it does so um you can surpass a whole lot of other people and so okay. they won't just consider you as the podiatrist you okay. are a military physician okay because that's one of the things that i was worried about in terms of being a podiatrist in the air force as um how would i be treated or seen no, you are a physician. Yeah. So, uh, so Dr. Wh Dr. Williams, um, number one, I put in the chat the name and the phone number of Dr. Al Glover. Okay. He's also, he's also on our board and he's former army. He was an army podiatrist before he went and, and became a civilian. He practices out in, in Los Angeles. Okay. You need to give him a call. He will be able to answer that question much more, uh, fully. I was in the army. I was in the army reserve as a podiatry student and as a resident and so forth and so on. So, oh, yeah. I, I, so I also had to do my military training at the same time. So I, I understand uh, where, where your question is coming from and all that other kind of good stuff. Keep in mind that in the military, your, your license is nationwide is wherever the, where, wherever Uncle Sam is. So you can bounce from spot to spot to spot and not to have to go through the, the same stuff. Like if I wanted to, to to move to Georgia, I would have and and, and hang out with uh Dr. Sneed. There's a whole, you know, fiery hoop I need to jump through in order to make oh, that. Okay. But as and if a, I want to go yeah. to Hawaii next year and practice there, I don't have to do anything different. Right. 
So, but as as a military physician, you don't have you got it. You know, you, your 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 license is the United States. So, so when you apply for a license, is not to a particular state, is what you're saying? Not in the military. Not okay. The military. As long and as you so from, I work for as long FQMC. As you go from post to post. Yeah. And so any kind of federal position you get, you know, whether it's at a VA or FQHC or whatever, your license is for the entire 50 states and the U.S. territories. Okay. Did not know that. Yeah. Dr. Williams? Yes, sir. Uh, Harkless. Uh, Hi, Dr. Harkless. From 1980 to 89, I trained military residents in the Army. Oh, wow. Uh, these were individuals that had been in the Army for a mi minimum of five years, but they never had a residency. And so I got honored by a two-star general for doing all of that. And I trained about two or three people in the Air Force. There's a guy named Jose Contreras. He is either the consultant surgeon general of the Air Force or right up under that. I'll, uh, I'll find him and connect you with him. And, and there's another guy named Brent Johnson, who's a podiatrist, but he's a full colonel. And he, he's not doing podiatry, but he's running a whole battalion or whatever you call it. Right. In the, in the Air Force, and I'll make sure I can connect you with uh, with both of them, et cetera. But Mary Cook is at the BA in Biloxi. Uh, she was the last military re uh, Air Force resident I trained, and uh, she's uh, the chief at the VA in Biloxi, and she can tell you about the Air Force because she spent time there for quite a while. Uh, but she, uh, uh, she had been in for several years also and had performed a primary care residency not the surgical part. So she spent a year with me doing surgery, I think from 92, 93 or 93, 94, somewhere back in there. And she's a very, very nice person from Mississippi and with the Jackson State and all of that. Just a great person also. But okay. I would be happy to, to do that, uh, et cetera. But you have an opportunity to have an outstanding career in the um, in the military uh, as, a, um, as a podiatrist. Yeah, absolutely. So I agree with Dr. Jefferson. And Dr. Glover is outstanding. He was in the Navy, uh, Jefferson. <laughs> Glover was in the Navy, the, the one you said you was going to connect her with in L.A. And, 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 and Glover worked alongside the past president of the National Medical Association from two years ago. Yeah, that's they're, right. They're, they're, they're homies, right? That's right. That's and right. so in the, in, in the military, Dr. Williams, you'll, you'll be rubbing elbows and hobnobbing and working alongside some some pretty dynamic people that you will get to know and continue to have relationships with them long after uh, your military uh, career uh, is is over. Uh, do, either Doctor uh, Pervez, I appreciate you being here. You have any any questions or comments? Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Jefferson. Hi, everyone. Thank you so <clears throat> much. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Doctor Harkless. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to hear you guys and, and um, listen to you all share your words of wisdom. So thank you. And who is Sonali's iPhone? Who haven't we heard from? She is also a resident. She's okay. Baylor Scott and White. Okay. Texas. All right. I think uh, we pretty much heard from everybody on this. Uh, we will be doing this again, folks. Uh, next time we do this, we'll be more focused on a on a particular subject. This is very wide open up. And, uh, you know, I even learned a lot. I thought, you know, I'm too old to learn stuff. I guess you're not. Never I doubt. That's uh, right. <laughs> but uh, we will we'll have, you know, specific items that we will uh, talk about as we continue to go uh, through this journey. Uh, let others know that, hey, the, the, the product section of the NMA is on it. We're about that business. We're about helping each other out. You know, I know people from coast to coast. You know, I can I I, I can drive from, from 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 Maine to San Diego and have me a spot to sit down and get a meal. I don't have to worry about it. All right. And uh Audrey, I don't know if you knew or not that that uh Dr. Dr. Harkless is ordained. So, you know, give a preacher oh. a microphone, you know how it is. <laughs> well, that explains, well, that explains why we went to church, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've, been, I've been blessed knowing Dr. Harper since I was a freshman in New York. 
and uh, we, we we've been kind of uh, I I didn't get, I didn't train under him in, in San Antonio. He had the one he had the most competitive program to get into back in those days. But I I, I say that because just because of wherever you may be, uh, residents and uh, up, up and coming residents, it, it doesn't matter where you are the next three four years. Make connections. The, uh, Dr. Williams just learned about some military stuff just for being over on, on, on this call for about over an hour or so. You never know who you're going to connect with. And these will be friends and colleagues that will help you over the next few years and throughout your entire career. Okay. So I remember sitting, sitting, sitting in the, uh, room in the uh, classroom in, in NYCPM, just jaw on the floor listening to Dr. Harper's talk about uh, whatever the subject matter was. And I've seen him in, in, in different conferences around the country. And he always has a word for me. We all, always can chat, chat. I can pick up the phone, Dr. Harper, hey, I'm no, we don't have anything going on. I just want to holler at you. He's that type of dude. He's that type of doc. And I try to be that way and everybody else here. So uh, but before we close, uh, we're going to, again, remind everybody, uh, go to nmanet.org, become a member tonight. Make it happen tonight. Our, our conference is going to be at uh, in Audrey's backyard in New Orleans. So uh, check that out. If you're unable to make it, I don't expect any interns to be there because you guys are, are literally right off the boat and they're putting you to work. They, 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 you're getting all the dirt work when you first get there. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But, you know, all that information you'll, you'll be able to get to uh, learn from later uh, on in the year after the convention. But again, we'll be doing this on a regular basis. We'll have specific subjects we'll talk about. And if there's anything that you want to talk about uh, in future meetings, let me know what that is. You know, I don't like Doc said, we don't have all the answers, but we want to hear and learn from you guys as well. So if there's nothing else, I want to thank everybody for joining. This was fantastic. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that was a first year student from the new school. I really want to talk to her and a little bit about the first year, especially in the new school since I was new at Western. Okay. Uh, I think her name was uh, Sandra Smith or she, something. Like yeah, she's still, she's still on. Yes, and, that's me. Yeah, uh, let me give you my number. It's it's not 909. 909? Yeah, 208 4315. 208. Say that last one one more time. Four three. One five. One five. Perfect. Thank you. That, that way we can talk and and I, I can help you a lot. Especially That'd be great. I appreciate that. I started a new school, so you knew all the different, yeah. different things you need to be thinking about and et cetera, preparing the best of your ability. So that's all good. Yes, Thanks for being what here. state are you in again? Uh, where where's your school? Lecom is in um Pennsylvania, Erie. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yeah, very uh, good. Hey, hey, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to everybody for joining in. And I, I, I'm sorry. You. Go, ahead. Sorry. go ahead. 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 Um, I'm always so, you know, floored at how much I learn when I come to these meetings. And um, I really appreciate it. And I'm so grateful to be part of this organization. So thank you, um, Dr. Harkless. It was so nice meeting you, Dr. Atkinson Snead, Dr. Jefferson course um and dr williams and everyone else um i'm i'm always very um i feel i i leave feeling more insightful than when i came so thank you so much it, it, it only gets better yes ma'am yes sir it only gets better, huma. <laughs> i just right. wanted to remember say huma, you said to, how third I'm year sorry, feels go, go. so different remember go ahead, go ahead, how third year go. feels so different well that's the way it is even the the older you get it gets it's that way every year. I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part you said. I'm so sorry. So remember you said how this year was so much easier for you now that you're not an intern anymore? Yeah. And so yeah. <laughs> it's that way. That it, it gets better and better like that. I hope so. It's it certainly hasn't been easier, but it's it's been different. So <laughs> I, I uh, Sonali, you were about to say something? Oh, yes. I just wanted to apologize. My phone was actually having um, some issues, but now I'm able to uh, speak. Um, I 
I am a rising second year resident in Texas at Baylor Scott and White. I have had the honor of meeting Dr. Harkless many times. Um, we met latest at the Bandera conference in Bandera, Texas last month. It was a pleasure talking with you. I really enjoyed um, every conversation I've had with him. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jefferson and all the other attendings here for um, really giving some wonderful insight on um, everything residency wise. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. All right. Th thank you. So uh, by the end of the weekend, when I go on to the website and log in, I look for the new podiatry members. I, I look to see all of your names. I want got to see that. All right. Very good. Again, we'll be doing this again uh, soon. Uh, Dr. Hawk is our liaison for residents and our section in the uh, NMA. She, so we, so she's been uh, exhibiting great leadership and we continue to look forward to what she's going to do uh, with us and for us and for the profession uh, in the next year. Thanks again, Huma, and everybody else. Everybody have a good night. If you're in the East Coast, Canada's hitting us hard again tomorrow. I, I know y'all are getting it up there. Uh, in, uh, New York.